session. So this, uh, this next session, the focus is on power system dynamics. There are five papers uh, across a range of different topics, um, but all with a dynamics flavor. So uh, the first paper, um, Joya Pekislopas will present and uh, uh, looking at frequency stability issues. Okay. Thank you. So good morning to all of you. So my paper today, this presentation is about the assessment of the frequency stability behavior uh, in the Iberian Peninsula in the years to come uh, due to the very high renewable penetration that we are foreseeing. So this is just to, to give you the context. So in, you, in the European Union, we are forecasting um, a tremendous increase in renewable uh, power sources for the coming years. You can see here the way how we foresee the evolution of the generation portfolio from 2025 up to 2050. So a large increase in solar PV generation, wind power, offshore wind power, and so on. And the same happens if we look at the Iberia, Iberian Peninsula. Um, so the case of Portugal, the case of Spain, sorry for the colors because my PhD student is blind color and so this is always a big problem <laughs> when he has to produce some of these nice um, graphics. Uh, anyway, the important thing here is that you can see that uh, wind power and the solar PV generation are supposed to increase largely in uh, Portugal and in Spain. And uh, so this means that also that um, thermal power plants, I mean, in this case, uh, coal-fired power plants are being decommissioned. And in Spain, it is a, there is a plan to, to also to close the nuclear power plants, all the nuclear power plants, until 2035. They are still in operation, all of them, but there is a, a plan for, for that to, to, to happen. Um, so, in this way, you can see that uh, uh, due to the fact that uh, all this generation is going to be uh, based on converter-based generation, so power electronics, instead of uh, synchronous units, so we, we, we are foreseeing that uh, high inertia will decrease largely, not only in the, in the Iberian Peninsula, but also in the Central European system. And these are um, so some results that uh, we got from ENZOE studies. So it's very interesting to evaluate, to analyze how the frequency stability will evolve for the coming years. And of course, we can do that by trying to analyze all the European system. But as you can see, this is a very large and complex system that goes now uh, up to Ukraine, Turkey, uh, and so this is a, quite a large system. And um, there is also another problem, that is um, the Iberian Peninsula is poorly interconnected with the Central European system. You can see it here. Only four interconnections exist, three at 400 kV, one at 220 kV. There are some plans for uh, interconnections additional interconnections through the Gulf of Biscaya here, uh, the INELFA project, uh, that will double the existing interconnection capacity, but this is something that may take place by 2030, to, or even better, 2035, because we all know that delays exist. So in this way, we, we looked at this problem and we tried to analyze how the frequency behavior in the Hibernian system will evolve, and uh, for that purpose, we develop a two-area electromechanical model. Uh, of course, one, mo one model for the Iberian Peninsula, and the other model for the uh, Central European system. So um, each control area was here represented by a swing equation, um, and of course, um, then in each swing equation, we need to know about uh, high inertias and dampings. And uh, also, the two systems are interconnected here, and uh, the representation is, is made through 
uh, synchronous uh, coefficient. Uh, a synchronizing coefficient, yes. Uh, of course, that uh, uh, in this case, we, we consider also um, primary frequency control loops um, associated to each one of the areas, representing the way how the different uh, technologies will respond uh, to uh, the load and balances and uh, generation and balances, which is exactly the case that we have addressed. So, uh, trying to do that, uh, okay, we could start uh, making some assumptions in terms of uh, inertia values, uh, damping values, and so on, but we thought that it was better to uh, use um, information from previous incidents that took place in, in, in the Iberian system. And uh, as a matter of fact, in 2011, there was um, a sudden disconnection of one gigawatt of a nuclear power plant, Almaraz, in Spain, that um, lead to this frequency behavior uh, in terms of so the Iberian Peninsula frequency behavior and the Central European uh, uh, behavior uh, for this case. And so what we did was to try to identify the parameters of that model because um, the model, okay, was, was the one that I described to you, but it was important to identify the parameters. And so this was a problem of parameter identification, nothing else more. So um, in this case, we adopted a well-known uh, approach that uh, we were trying to minimize the square of the deviations between so the response the system presented and the response the model was presenting with different um, parameters that uh, have been uh, tried. And um, in this case, we adopted for motor of optimization a variant of the particle swarm optimization uh, um, approach. And um, uh, we were capable to, to, to get the parameters. But before getting the parameters, we, we developed a methodology for this purpose. So this methodology was on the first stage, we used a, a simple model, a much more simple model, where you can see here there is no representation, detailed representation for the different technologies participating in frequency control. And primary frequency control, I mean, or frequency containment reserve, if you, if you prefer. And so here we were trying mainly to identify the parameters of the inertias, the dumping coefficients and the synchronizing coefficients. And so with the results from this first iteration, we were feeding the, the overall, uh, the overall uh, model, uh, the overall system, and then trying to obtain um, all the, the parameters of all this system that, of course, apart from the ones that I mentioned, involve also the droops, uh, the transient droops for the, for the hydro, uh, hydro, hydro units and so on. And, um, of course, um, the, the solution uh, we got was this one. I can tell you that um, um, we had it on top of uh, this objective function some restrictions some restrictions uh, related with the, the values of the, that the, the parameters could, uh, could, could uh, we would allow the parameters to, to take because, for instance, very large damping values, they make no sense. And so in this way, we were also forcing uh, the solution in, in, in some way. But anyway, the important thing here is that it was possible to obtain uh, a representation that uh, you can see here was um, um, a bit uh, uh, exaggerated in terms of the, the response, but uh, from the absolute values, this is not that much. And uh, as a matter of fact, this was a, a, a little bit a conservative approach in, in s s some way, but very important. And uh, I have not mentioned it yet, but we were concerned about two metrics for assessing the frequency stability. So one of the metrics was the Rockoff, the rate of change of frequency, and the other metro, metric was the nadir of the frequency excursion. So the, the nadir and the Rockoff. So these were, in fact, uh, the metrics of concern, the metrics that would give us an idea of how uh, strong the system was. 
Uh, of course, that it was possible, as you can see, to get very good results. So this, the, 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 the parameters we got, they fitted very well with the, with the, with the, the initial recorded uh, pa values that were obtained from, from, from the, the disturbance. But those parameters, in this case, they were presenting non-realistic values. And so this is the reason why uh, we, we, at the end, we, we kept these values here. We kept these ones. Okay, assuming that this was a little bit pessimistic, namely regarding the nadir. Uh, and then, trying to see how the system would behave up to 2040, then it was necessary to, to try to identify the way how the different technologies would be di dispatched along the year, and so we, we had some information about um, uh, the, the dispatches in the Iberian Peninsula. So coming from the, the information that the, both TSOs in, in Portugal and in Spain were providing. And so for 2019, this was our year of reference, we, we had this information regarding average, monthly average productions. And of course, then we looked uh, at the, at, to the future, assuming that, as I'm stating here, all coal fire plants, fire power plants are to be decommissioned until 2031. And I can tell you that uh, in Portugal, we already closed all coal fire power plants. And in Spain, at least one has already also been decommissioned. So nuclear power plants are also to be decommissioned in Spain until 2036. The share of solar PV generation will grow from 4 to 24 percent. So that's incredible. The amount of solar PV generation that in Portugal and Spain is, in, is increasing every year. Also, the wind generation will grow. And now we are looking more at offshore wind generation because uh, for uh, onshore, all the good places are taken for to produce um, power from wind, wind generation. And also, we, we, we take into account a very important player here in this game that are the small steam turbines uh, that are related with biomass units and cogeneration units. And, in fact, they are synchronous machines. And these synchronous machines, they are very, very important for the frequency stability in the Iberian system. And, of course, we kept the share of hydro plants because there's no, not many more places where to put new hydropower plants. But very important was also to try to look at the, at the, most, the most critical operating scenarios. And the most critical operating scenarios were winter valley scenarios, where for winter valley scenarios we would have a lot of wind power, wind power generation, especially uh, as you can see, we foresee that for 2040, so the tre tremendous amount of wind power generation. Uh, and also, another critical scenario, a peak power, peak PV power scenario, typically from a summer, uh, okay, from a summer, a summer e month. Oops. Uh, and uh, so in this way, it is possible to get some sensitivity studies regarding the inertia variations and the composition of the generation portfolio. You can see it here that typically we found that uh, the spring months are the most critical ones because there is a lot of uh, wind power generation as well as solar PV generation. And um, then we try to look more carefully at the situations related with um, the peak and winter valley scenarios. And here you can see the way how the Nadir and the Rockoff are supposed to evolve in the coming years. And of course, we can see that the Nadir is not a big problem because the, according to EU regulations, uh, the system can have uh, frequency excursions up to 800 millihertz uh, in terms of Nadir. But the Rockoff uh, can be a matter of concern because the, the, the the rock off that uh, these system operators would like to have uh, should not be larger than one hertz per, se one, uh, hertz per second. 
And then we, we also looked carefully at the possibility that is to decrease the presence of code generation units, not because they are going to be uh, closed, but because natural gas code generation units tend to be replaced by other heat sources, like hydrogen. And so, if this happens, then this means a reduction in the synchronous inertia, and this means serious threats to system stability. Because you can see here, we dramatically increase the Rockoff values. Okay? Well, then, uh, with this scenario, we try to identify what solutions could be adopted. And, um, okay, one of the solutions we tried to, to look at was to use synchronous compensators. And um, we, we, in this case, we considered to, to connect three synchronous compensators with an inertia similar to the, to the inertia of the uh, generation units that have been decommissioned recently, and the, the coal-fired power plants that have been decommissioned recently. And uh, you can see that we have improved, we have improved the condition the, the, of, um, the, of the operation of the system. But we had to look, and um, this is also uh, trying to go a little bit further, according to after the, the, some of the comments of the reviewers, we extended the, this model with new frequency support services. And uh, in this case, so we were considering um, synchronous inertia, we were considering fast frequency response, uh, and, uh, of course, also considering the possibility that battery energy storage systems could provide this synchronous inertia. And for this case, we added this, all this block that represents all the, the power electronic uh, response to, uh, to help in, uh, in, the, in the frequency uh, behavior of the system. And uh, for these cases, and I, sh I can show you that, for instance, the effect... Oh, by the way, let me sh come back just to show you, here you can see that uh, the frequency behavior without the new frequency support services and with the new frequency support services. And what we can get is that clearly the nadir is reduced, but not the rock-off. And this is because the time delays that are uh, related with um, so measuring and processing all the information are typically around 50 milliseconds. And these 50 milliseconds, they, they do not bring uh, enough capability of response from these um, uh, frequency support surfaces. And this way, the Rockoff is not improved that much. Anyway, I would like to show you, uh, in this case, the effect of synthetic inertia provided by grid-following converters, in this case. And what we can see is that, for instance, the nadir is improved, is improving, as it was expected. However, the, the, the rock-off, uh, we got no, not very, very big improvement. And I would like to conclude by saying that, uh, so the replacement of a thermal generation uh, in the coming years will provoke system nadirs and rock-off absolute values um, that will be quite larger than the today's situation. So if the one hertz per second is surpassed, as identified in our studies, the system may enter into an alert zone. Uh, and it may happen that we, the system may have to face a cascade of events, like sudden disconnection of grid synchronous generators due to the rock of protections operation, sudden disconnection of the solar wind power plants and cogeneration plants due to the operation of uh, of frequency protections. And of course, all this would provoke um, a much larger uh, event uh, that would trigger the need to use load shedding. And we don't want to use load shedding because uh, we are just increasing uh, renewable generation. So it is therefore important to start preparing the system with supplementary control actions, like for instance, uh, consider the operation of synchronous condensers analyze the effectiveness of additional frequency control services, and increase the withstand capability of power generation units, and establish fast, faster reacting system protection schemes. Thank you very much. Is there a question? Sure. Just the one question. 
Hi, I'm Adam Birchfield uh, from Texas A&M University. Thank you for the nice presentation. Um, I wanted to ask about, uh, it seemed like I understood from your presentation that you have this estimation of the inertia for the Iberian Peninsula and then for the rest of Europe. Um, did you, were you able to compare that with uh, the way, like in Texas and other places, they quantify the inertia by just summing up H times S base? Um, do you have any comparison of the inertia that you got from that versus the other one? And a related question, you mentioned that you got uh, unrealistic values. Could you elaborate more on like how those values, how you know those values are unrealistic? For, for the inertias, you mean? Uh, yes. Well, you, you, what we did is um, on the basis of the, um, the way our generation would be dispatched, we, we were modulating, uh, so inertias, values, uh, assuming that we have a, a base uh, value for those um, inertias and yeah, dampings and so on, that was for the year 2019. And so we, were, we have been capable to modulate accordingly uh, the way how the, the, the different technologies of generation are supposed to evolve. And so we were modulating damping, inertia, and also um, the, the so the, the way how the, the machines were, were, were responding in terms of um, droops. Okay. Okay. I can, yeah. afterwards we can talk with more detail. Thank you very much. Okay. Th thank you very much. So the second paper. Okay, great. Looks like we have two presenters. Yeah. Um, second paper is looking at single phase uh, synchronous in inverter for grid stabilization. And I apologize, I don't know which of the authors these uh, are presenting, but I'll let them introduce themselves. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm Yoshihu Misoka from Hiroshima University. And he is a professor Sekizaki at the same university. And I have, I have to say one thing. Uh, professor Yurino is the first author. He was eager to be here, but um, he has moved to the other, one of the National College of Technology in Japan and as a president. So um, he was so busy, and then he didn't take a very big risk to be here. So um, he asked me to convey his sincere thanks to all of you and especially to the uh, organizing committee and the steering committee. So we will present <laughs> that this paper on behalf of him. So um, take, uh, please give me a, uh, us a little more time to present this paper. Thank you very much. The title is Development of the Single Phase uh, Synchronous Inverter for Grid Stabilization. And as you know, uh, low inertia problems uh, caused by the variable uh, renewable energy, of course, include uh, frequency stability problems and then uh, uh, transient state state stability problems. And grid forming inverters are um, expected to solve the problems as a, one of the promising options. And then we have developed and also developing um, Phase, uh, single phase synchronous inverter called SSI. The SSI can form a single phase microgrid. The single phase is the main point of this presentation. And then this, slide showed, um, this figure shows them um, power system and it includes an SSI. This is a lower voltage distribution network, that image of the lower distribution network. As you know, Japan is a um, dangerous, uh, not dangerous country. Um, this is just a um, <laughs> um, safe country, but we have con considerable pro uh, <laughs> say, uh, uh, probability of the natural disasters, like um, typhoon attacks and then earthquakes and something like that. So our main point is to achieve and realize that this kind of, how do you say, a single phase, very small, microgrid to survive that kind of very tough times. And our, pro uh, our focusing on the problem is there is a difficulty in verifying the stabilizing effect of GFM inverters. 
but there is no suitable in, uh, inverter models. Mm, the word no is kind of strong, but um, that fully satisfy the requirements for the power system stabilization analysis. In the previous sessions, there was a good presentation about um, modeling, and then also this is, I'm sorry. We are talking about uh, the fully, fully satisfy the requirements. There was a big difficult problems. And then we have three tasks to design controllers for the CSI obtained, uh, oriented to the stabilizing grid. And the second one is to develop an urban simulation tool for SSI to verify its grid stabilizing performance. And the third one is to investigate the grid stabilizing effect of SSI. So the, this presentation contains a three part and two parts. And the first one is to design the concept of SSI for the grid stabilization. And the second one is RM's simulation tool for SSI for power system analysis. And the third one is a grid stabilization effect of the SSI investigated in the, in the end of the first uh, half. The fourth one is a uh, conceptual planning of a single phase microgrid using SSI. So I already mentioned that uh, Japan is very high risk country to survive the, the kind of natural disasters, difficult times. So uh, we have the conceptual planning of the single phase microgrid. And the last one is the uh, SMG, single, uh, single phase microgrid operations in the stand, uh, standalone and the grid connected operations. We have already developed uh, uh, experimental environment and then did the experiment based on the actual uh, system. This slide shows them, um, how do you see? Uh, this is a slide shows the basic principle and then to uh, design the SSI. Power system, original power system can be uh, divided into the slow response, uh, slow response subsystems and the fast subsystems. That means a slow system in corresponding to the power system dynamics. And then the fast one is uh, corresponding to the uh, shell fast subsystem means an, an inverter oriented control, uh, for example, a modulation or something like that. So our core is uh, corresponding to the power system behavior, and um, shell means an um, inverter-oriented control uh, behavior, like modulation or something like that. Okay, this is the outline of the, our SSI. This is the, there is a DC side batteries in the single phase inverters, and then connecting to the grid to supply the uh, single phase power. The right hand side is the conceptual design of the system. We don't have enough time to pre-check the uh, paper after the presentation. This is the, based on the uh, thing equation of system. Uh, SSI is designed with based on the thing. Uh, this is swing equation, and we also prepare the AVR, AQR controller that can be switched depending on the Operation and design, operation, uh, I'm sorry, operation mode. The big objective of this presentation is to develop the RMS simulation tool to uh, simulate the um, power system operation. And then, second one is a disturbance that's simulating a short circuit fault for 0 0.1 second is generated. And then, uh, the fault is clear. That is a condition of the, to check the developed models based on the actual experimental results. So experiment, experiment using the real inverter and then uh, hardware in the loop simulations and the RMS simulations are conducted and to compare with uh, uh, each other. Okay, so the, uh, the second part is presented by the Professor Sekizaki. Thank you. Uh, hello. Uh, I will present the following contents from here. Uh, this slide shows the uh, comparison results uh, among the experiments, uh, here simulation and RM simulation. Uh, in the left figures, 
Oh, sorry. Lift here, the blue waveform shows the RMA simulation result, and the fault occurs at 0.4 seconds and cleared at 0.5 seconds. And you can see that in the left figures, the RMA simulation result successfully approximates the waveforms of the experiment and the human simulations. And on the right figure, the green frame for waveforms uh, shows the uh, instantaneous active, uh, power output of SSI. And also, you can see that in the right figures, and uh, develop the RMA simulation tool uh, can successfully approximate a quick response of our, our SSI hardware design. And having confirmed the accuracy of the simulation result, uh, we have developed the RMS analysis tool for power system analysis and stability assessment. Uh, the simulation model uh, uh, shown in left figure uh, consists of the SSI core model and the conventional generator model and the uh, uh, network model like this. And the uh, developed method is comp compared with the Y method uh, standard tool by Creepy for transit stability analysis. Creepy is a uh, research institute in Japan for power system. And uh, in the uh, right figures, you can see that the computed response of generators by the developed RMS analysis tool uh, are almost equivalent to each other, uh, uh, equivalent to the Creepy uh, uh, Y method re results. So uh, this slide shows a uh, uh, frequency stability variation for generator trips. The left figure shows the frequency response and the vertical axis represents frequency. And the right figure shows the relation step between lock-off and frequency nadir. And we have conducted the uh, simulation uh, for four cases. And in case, uh, uh, each case, the uh, installation ratio of PVs and SS are different. And you can see that uh, from these re uh, figures, the rock-off and frequency nadir, uh, which degrade due to the installation of the PVs, can, uh, is significantly improved by installation of SSI. And next, uh, this slide shows the transient stability variation for three-phase three ground fault. And we have also conducted the four cases like uh, as shown uh, slides before, uh, case one, two, three, and four. And you can see that the transient stability is, uh, transient stability of the power system is also improved by the number of SSI's installation like this. And uh, we also performed the uh, uh, steady state stability uh, evaluation using the eigenvalue analysis of the power system. And uh, we have conducted the uh, eigenvalue analysis for four cases as shown the slides before, case one, two, three, and four. And this figure shows the result, and the uh, left figure shows the steady state result, and the right figure shows the uh, result when the uh, fourth trips the generator. And you can see that the steady state stability is also improved by, uh, for all of those cases by installation of SSIs. So uh, the SSI uh, uh, with the uh, NIC design uh, can be used to form a single phase microgrid and operate them in iodine mode. This slide shows the design of a single phase microgrid and uh, Many consumers are connected to the low voltage uh, distribution system where batteries and PVs are connected to the grid with uh, VR SSIs. And the uh, uh, proposed system with uh, SSIs can survive like a meter even if there are uh, individual uh, single phase microgrids are separated due to natural disaster. The SSI with the proposed NIC design enables the grid stabilization and also grid resilience enhancement simultaneously. Uh, we would, uh, I would like to demonstrate the, some example uh, experimental results uh, 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 for single phase microgrid operation using SSIs. The upper right figure shows the circuit configuration uh, of single phase microgrid in the experiment, and the uh, uh, lower right figure shows uh, is a photograph of the experimental environment. And the proposed controllers are implemented into two SSIs, and we have conducted the experiment for grid connected operation and standard operation by one SSI and iron D to microgrid operation by two SSIs. Oh. Oh, okay. uh, this stress shows the uh, uh, experimental results when SSI one synchronizes with the grid and operates them uh, independently from time 25 seconds. 
This figure shows the output current of SSI1, active power output, and frequency, respectively. And you can see that SSI1 successfully synchronizes the grid and uh, maintains the frequency, uh, even in the standard mode. And also the SSI uh, maintains the voltage even in the standard mode. And when the load increases at time uh, 40 seconds, the active power output of SSI1 automatically increased and the frequency decreases according to the characteristic of a synchronous machine. And this slide shows the uh, experimental results. Uh, when SSI 1 and 2 operate a single phase, uh, identity single phase microgrid. And uh, these figures show the output current of SSI 1, active power output, and frequency respectively. And uh, active power output references is changed at 25 second and uh, SSI1 discharges and SSI2 charges uh, according to the, the, the references. And uh, you can see that the, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, uh, when the load increases at time uh, 35 seconds, the active power outputs of SSI1 and 2 uh, automatically increased and uh, uh, to operate the, the microgrid in, in parallel. So from this result, uh, the uh, single phase microgrid operation using SSI is confirmed by the experiments. Okay, uh, I'd like to uh, conclude this presentation. And we have developed the uh, SSI hardware based on the NIC design concept, then developed the RM simulation tool of SSI for power system analysis and verify the effectiveness of the RMS simulation tool by the experiments are human simulation, and demonstrate the effect basis on the frequency stability, transit stability, and steady state stability. And also, uh, it's, this is very important, uh, we have uh, verified effectiveness of the proposed SSI hardware in the laboratory experiment. Our future work will include the uh, experiment for single phase microwave operation using SSIs, as well as the over current protection uh, over, uh, for SSI uh, by using the current control. That's all. Thank you for very your kind attention. Uh, we have time for a clarifying question. Uh, Gregor Verbich, <laughs> University of Sydney. Very interesting work. In, as a matter of fact, we did something very similar um, we published in Smart Grids last year. So essentially what we uh, looked at was a residential feeder where we assume that each prosumer has a PV battery system that can operate in a grid forming mode. So then we like uh, disconnected the feeder from the grid. And what we found, so all our results agree with yours, but what, what we have also found on top of that, as you increase the length of the feeder, as you put more grid forming inverters, like you string them one by one, the system becomes unstable. Um, what we also found is that depending on the time constant of the DC source, so for example, um, the lithium ion battery is fine, it's probably fast enough, but if you use something slower, for example, a fuel cell or maybe a flow battery, then the dynamics of the DC source is not sufficiently fast to support stable operation, so the system also becomes unstable. And this was just a, a comment, maybe you haven't explicitly looked into that, but you realize that when you have a radial uh, single phase microgrid, then you get into stability issues as you increase the number of, um, of grid, grid forming converters. <laughs> now, that, that was just a comment. It wasn't really a, yeah. um, just wanted to. Yeah, that's right, that's right. Um, okay. yeah. do, do you want to comment or respond? Okay, well, thank you very much for your presentation. ...of electric vehicles for primary frequency control, and the presenter is Rodrigo Ramos. Almost a presenter. We should tell a joke or something. <laughs> okay. Okay, there Thank we you. go. Great. Thank you.
Okay, sorry, sorry for the delay. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> well, sorry for the delay, and uh, thank you for the introduction. I um, I want to start my presentation with a, a disclaimer because I don't want the paper to be seen as the ugly duckling of the session. Um, this um, work was um, done by Ms. Amanda Fernandez um, as part of her undergrad studies. Uh, she uh, made an exchange uh, in Spain, was advised by Professor Miguel Carrion from um, uh, University of Castilla-La Mancha uh, and Professor Ruth Dominguez um, and uh, myself, Professor Ada Pavani and Werbeston Oliveira also contributed from Brazil. Um, so this is, as, as I mentioned, this is part of an undergrad um, uh, work. So I, uh, uh, you know, the, the disclaimer is that uh, you should not expect too much novelty from uh, the, the presentation. But um, anyway, um, this is the outline of the presentation. For the sake of time, I'm going just uh, uh, very quickly to uh, this. Um, the uh, focus of the presentation is to assess the participation of um, electric vehicles in day ahead energy de generation, not, not market, it's not exactly market, but uh, in the provision of ancillary services in a predominantly renewable isolated system. Um, the, the, the context here is that um, the work is done based on a remote community, uh, just like uh, the one that was presented in the last session yesterday. Um, but it isn't in a remote community in Brazil. The only difference is that uh, there is a ver the, this, this community is uh, within the Amazon region and uh, they have a very weak connection to Manaus, which is the largest city in the Amazon. They have a weak connection and uh, they have lots of trouble with this connection. So within, when, when they lose it, they end up having to, um, to work as an isolated microgrid. But we adopted the, con the, 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 the contacts uh, in which they are um, operating as an active distribution network. So they, we, we assume that they are connected to the main power grid, although uh, they, they can, can operate as, as a microgrid as well. Um, so, to, to, uh, and the idea basically was to see what was the impact of considering the electric vehicles within the campus. Uh, the, there's a federal university of Amapá, which is in the middle of the Amazon. They have uh, invested to create a, a university there. And in the campus, they have um, uh, some electric vehicles. Uh, and then the idea is to formulate a linear program uh, to, um, uh, um, to, to be able to schedule the participation of these electric vehicles in uh, the frequency regulation of the, um, the campus. And um, um, well, the objective function is this one. I'm not going through this in in, in detail because there's, uh, there are too many uh, variables and parameters and, and all this stuff that it would be uh, to uh, take too much time to explain. But uh, the main constraints to which this objective function uh, is subject is um, the electric vehicles, the, the constraints related to the electric vehicles themselves, um, renewable energy sources, the power flow, frequency deviation, frequency regulation, and the operation of generating units in the sense that we want to understand what happens when a contingency takes one of the sources out. So uh, 
how dangerous it is for, for the, the system operation uh, to, to lose one of the uh, few generating units they have there. So um, then the microgrid uh, corresponds to the Marco Zero, uh, so it's the zero, uh, 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 zero spot campus of the Federal University of Amapá. And um, the Marco Zero campus is, is this is because the, uh, e the, the equator line crosses the campus. So that's the idea of the Marco Zero. Um, and the microgrid is, uh, that operates as an, as an active distribution network uh, is composed of 64, bu uh, 64 buses, 63 lines, 32 consumer units, and five generators. I'll talk a little about, a bit more about these generators later on. Um, uh, so about these, uh, um, these res generating resources, these are the technical characteristics of the dispatchable units, which are um, diesel generators. So you can see here three units, and this unit three will have uh, a, a big impact on, on the system. Although the, the coefficients are, are, are the same, you will see that unit three because of the place it is located, it has a big impact on, on the, the, the system. Uh, we, uh, the, they have also uh, intermittent units, which are basically uh, solar PV. Um, so these are the characteristics for them. And um, then um, we assume that there were six uh, uh, electric vehicle charging points considered, uh, which should be located at strategic, strategic points in, uh, uh, of the university campus. So uh, we worked with three models of electric vehicles. The first one um, that we call group one here is basically uh, electric vehicles that are used for administrative purposes. And groups two and three are related to, um, to uh, um, buses that, they, um, that, that go around the campus to, to, um, to transport the students and uh, the, the other um, members uh, of the community. Um, so the idea is to analyze three different, uh, oh, here is the um, load curve, a typical load curve of the um, the, 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 the area, the, 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 the campus, um, and it is pretty much, uh, it, it does not vary much because it's near the equator, so we, they, they do not have uh, too, much, too many seasonal effects. Uh, and this is the availability factor of the intermittent units, basically the solar PVs. Um, and uh, this is ours here, so uh, the, the curve sort of kind of, uh, you know, uh, it is uh, closed around itself. Um, so then we wanted to analyze three cases. Uh, case, case one is um, day ahead scheduling without considering frequency reserve constraints. Case two, they had scheduling with frequency reserve constraints, but only the generator units, uh, and by that I mean diesel and solar PV, only them can participate in the service. And case three is the case in which uh, the electric vehicles can also participate in the service. So what we see here is that um, in case one, it becomes clear that unit three, uh, the, I, I previously mentioned the unit, uh, uh, the diesel generator, it, the, the, the system is, uh, has a high reliance on the diesel generator. So this means that if this generator is lost, this, the, 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 the operation of the system is at stake. Um, and then we wanted to reduce the, the dependency of the system 
uh, uh, on this generator. So we allowed the uh, other uh, units, either dispatchable or non-dispatchable, uh, to participate, to, to provide frequency regulation to the system. So what we were able to flatten the curve and reduce the dependency on generator three. So then it becomes more reliable in the sense that uh, if we lose any of these units, um, the, the, the system is not at so much risk anymore. Uh, and the third case, if we allow PVs to participate, you can not see much improvement in here, uh, but there's, you know, there, there's a few, uh, um, it, it becomes a little better. But then, um, if we look at contingencies, then uh, we, we see the value of the electric vehicles participating in the, um, in, in, in the frequency uh, reserve um, uh, uh, service. So uh, this, these units, K1, K2, and K3, are the generating uh, are the diesel ones. Uh, this is the uh, 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 this is diesel generator number three, which is the most critical one. And these two are solar PV. So the idea is, and, and this is this uh, this graph, the, 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 this picture shows um, what happens if a contingency takes out one of these generators. So uh, this, uh, these negative powers here are the powers that the generator, gener the generator that was lost was supplying before the contingency. And so ideally, what we would like to do is to have symmetric uh, um, plots here because the more, the more symmetric they are, the better, uh, the, 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 the better are the chances of the system surviving the loss of one of these generating units. Um, and we can see that if um, no, no, none of these generators are, um, are uh, uh, participating in the frequency regulation market, uh, well, the frequency regu uh, regulation service, then these are the plots, then only diesel and PV, and then uh, all the generators. So it gets more symmetrical as we allow the other generators to participate and the electric vehicles as well. Um, here is the unserved demand post-contingency, and you can see that if we do not allow the generators within the campus to participate in frequency regulation, what we see, what, it, what happens is that we have unserved demand post-contingency pre pretty much all day. And if we allow only the, the uh, diesel and PV, uh, we, have, we only have a problem here when the PV it, the, the can, cannot, um, cannot provide this service. Um, so uh, here um, we have a, a comparison of costs and the, um, the most important thing here is that in case three, we could reduce the cost of unserved demand to zero. And this is by far the most important cost, the, the, the largest cost of them all. So we were, we were able to reduce the total amount of cost uh, from one, uh, 179 uh, million to 15 million. Uh, Bear in mind that we have a uh, currency exchange rate, so you see those huge numbers for a microgrid. Uh, uh, the, the, this has to be taken into account. Um, so in conclusion, the results, um, uh, they clearly show that uh, allowing the electric vehicles to participate in the frequency regulation service are um, it, it is an important uh, uh, contribution, and um, uh, 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 other than that, uh, uh, or uh, furthermore, uh, this was uh, 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 work done in the microgrid, and of course, in a large system, the contribution of electric 
electric vehicles is, is expected to be even more, more relevant. Now, I just wanted to, to have a, a, a final comment, uh, just, just for closure, uh, because um, I understand that I, I'm not telling anything very surprising to you. Uh, some, some of these uh, is, are quite obvious conclusions. But the thing I, I, I'd like to stress out is that this, this student came out of a remote community. Um, she went abroad to another country, uh, another language, uh, an, at, an, uh, at the undergrad uh, a, uh, period, and uh, did uh, 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 a fairly uh, um, interesting work. Um, and therefore, I, I, I'm not, uh, although there is not, not much innovation in here, I think the archival value of this is the fact that someone went, uh, had to leave her community, uh, isolated community, and started, uh, and, and continued working for the benefit of it. And now I am truly proud to see how much she, she, has, um, she has grown, but she still keeps uh, caring about the, the place where she came from. So this is the last remark I, I wanted to make uh, about this work. So thank you very much for your attention, and this concludes my presentation. Thank you. Is there? Yeah. Yeah, Claudio. Uh, Claudio Canizar, University of Waterloo. Interesting work. I don't think you need to put any uh, justify or any excuses for it. I think it's valuable. Uh, uh, even more so if we, as you said, the result of work from a person from these communities. Ha having worked with remote communities in Canada, I think that that's a very challenging issue. And something to be proud of. Congratulations for that. Now, my question is regarding the dynamics. How, I'm not quite clear how you modeled the frequency dynamics for the whole system, right? Uh, you also have the electric vehicles, you have the solar PV, I guess, was supply, supply, supplying some frequency control. Did I understand that correctly? Yeah. So I would appreciate if you can elaborate on that. And the second part, uh, question is regarding whether you consider the, the, the different phases or it's just a single phase type of model. Thank you. Uh, yeah, um, well, uh, thank you, Claudio, for the, for, for the question. Um, by ugly duckling, I mean we, um, we made a completely static approach as opposed to the other papers in this section, uh, in, in the session. Uh, because uh, to, to, to uh, assign a transient stability constrained OPF problem to an undergrad student sounded too much, so uh, we, we uh, did not include dynamics in, in, in this study. Um, so it was just planning. Uh, I'm not sure if, if this explained the first part of, of, of your so question. Because it like be a bigger or any of that? No, no. We actually considered that, uh, un, uh, that uh, un, unattended or, or, or unserved demand would result in, in the frequency decline. But we, 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 this, this would be acceptable as long as it did not uh, violate any limit. Um, and the, the, the other part of the question was about single phase or, or three phase. Uh, the, the model is, is, is a three phase one. So um, we, we were, were able to capture these um, you know, subtleties, uh, not <laughs> too subtle actually, uh, about uh, single phase connected loads and, and uh, electric vehicles. Okay, so the next paper will be presented by Mad Talmasaki, and the, the focus is on AGC signals, forecasting, analysis and forecasting. Um, I, I did actually think of a joke to fill in some time, but 
looks like we're underway, so I'll have to leave it till the next break. You were so fast. I had to run down the stairs. This is a dangerous conference. All right. Let's try it in front of the podium this time. So thank you, everyone, for being here. I'm presenting on behalf of our former PhD student who is now postdoc at Virginia Tech, uh, my other co-authors on sabbatical in Zurich, and which is basically, I think it looks kind of like this, doesn't it? And then I'm here. Uh, and so we'll talk about forecasting of automatic generation, automatic generation control signals. And the reason we're doing this is because we needed it, couldn't find it anywhere, and so we made it. And so I'll talk about that. So I don't think I have to convince most of you what regulation is. So grid services are needed to ensure load balancing. There are different types of grid services. I will focus on regulation. That is, that's why Joachim did the behind the back. Okay. I thought it was a style. All right. Okay. Grid services can also be valuable. And so you know, we've done some back of the envelope calculations in ISO New England. And we can see that flexibility in general, whether it comes from an aggregate fleet, from batteries, or from thermal generators, can generate somewhere around $100 to $1,000 per kilowatt that's flexible per year. And so that could be why we have so many products these days. They're the prosumer, they're virtual battery products, they're virtual power plant products. And I just learned of a new one yesterday called the conducer, which I think goes with prosumers. And if you put them together, you just get pros producers and consumers. Good. That's from, that's H is for Hiskins. <laughs> uh, so your batteries, thermal power plants, basically we all need ancillary services and they can come from anywhere. And so we talked yesterday, I talked about how different coordination schemes, you can implement, you know, top down coordination, there are bottom up coordination schemes. In the end, they all need a power reference signal. And if you're providing grid services, I'll use my left hand. If you're providing grid services of some kind, you need this power reference signal, which is a balancing signal. And so if obviously if you could forecast this signal, you can optimize the behavior of your fleet, your batteries, or your generators. And so that's what we're looking at. And so frequency regulation is a grid service in certain territories. And so the area we're focused on is PJM's territory. Um, they have, I don't have to teach you about frequency regulation, but basically you have an area control error that gets taken by PJM and then through a scheme they produce a Reg A signal and a Reg D signal. I'll focus on Reg D signal which is energy neutral. Uh, this formulation from PJM came about since 2016. They changed it to add this, oops, this conditional neutrality element to it. Um, and so there are some terms you just need to mention. When you, set, when you limit, when you saturate your Reg D signal, that's called pecking. And so the Reg D signal lives in a, in a space, compact space, negative one to one. And when you're negative one or one, it's called the signal is pegged. We do not generally have access to these parameters in this box. What we do have access to is historical data. And so we want to take the historical Reg D data from PJM, which is available online for a couple of years worth of data. We want to see you know, if we can, if we can deliver these grid services, can we do a better job with, um, where is it, with some kind of prediction of the AGC signal, which is this red line here. And so in yesterday's presentation and in some work we've done in the past, what we've seen is that certain resources have a, are able to ramp up rather quickly, and you can see that in these cases here and here, it ramps up very quickly, so the resource is quite flexible up, but it's slowed down, so it's ramped down limited. And so if you could predict when your AGC signal is going down, you can preposition your resources to essentially, in, in, in packetized case, you would pre-reject packet requests, and so you would de drop down your, you would, you would reduce your load faster and therefore provide a better resource. You can increase your precision score, increase your composite score, and therefore earn more money performing grid services. We then went out to look for literature on forecasting AGC. I've seen a lot of papers on predictive control for frequency regulation. So we thought we'd find a lot of references for forecasting AGC. These are the only three papers we really found. This one does some interesting statistics, looks at periodicity, but doesn't build any statistical models, which could be used for control design, and doesn't do any forecasting. 
Uh, this work by, this is uh, John Carnegie Mellon and Argonne from 2014, looked at optimizing batteries with respect to AGC by accounting for the energy content of the AGC signal. And so that didn't look at the power signal, which was what we're focusing on. It looked at hourly changes in the energy content of the AGC signal, which basically tries to deal with the fact that the AGC signal in 2014 was not energy neutral. And so you would have drifts. And that drift could affect how you participate with batteries in frequency regulation services. And the last one here just outlines the pegging methodology that PJM uses. So these are the three resources we could find. If others have resources, references, we're happy to, to learn from those. So the question we want to ask is how predictable is the signal? So we did very simple signal analysis. Um, just a couple of things. I'll, I'll just mention kind of what we found, and then I'll show you the model we use. And it's justified. So the probability density of reg D is, looks like a truncated, truncated Gaussian. As you can see, the pecking, these minus one and plus one, happen significantly often, around 25% of the time. If you look at a power spectral density of the reg D signal, it's low path in nature. What's interesting is if you look over each of the months, you see that the bandwidth of the PJM reg D signal is quite constant. So yesterday we talked about a robust model. And so this would indicate that if you can build, this would indicate that this power spectral density you're seeing here is applicable across the different months of the year. Looking at white sense, white sense stationarity, if we want to build a statistical model, we want to drive it with a stationary random process, we need a white sense stationary system. And so what we're able to show is that looking at sample mean, sample variances, and the settling times of these, that reg D appears to be white sense stationary and ergodic. And so we can actually develop a stationary um, model to drive the statistical model we're looking at. Pecking is fairly important. Um, it's also fairly interesting. And the changes or variability in the ATC value, remember, remember it goes from negative one to one. And so we want to just look at the statistics of how does the ATC vary over different time scales. And so here you look at within every minute, what is the variance of the ATC signal in minute one of each hour, minute two of each hour, for the, for every minute of an hour for all of the data set. We looked at different hours of the day, 24 hours in a day. We looked at the variance of each hour of the day. We did the same thing for the weekdays, and we did the same thing for the month. I'm not, there's some patterns that are funky. I had expected that when you have market participating assets, right, the market, the prices updates in PJM is every five minutes or every 15 minutes. I would expect that that set point change generators would cost it is a variance that we would then see every five minutes of the hour, every 15 minutes of the hour. But we didn't see that. That was surprising. Then on the hourly variance, we have this in blue line here. So the blue line represents the change, the mean variance of the AGC value for different hours of the day. And you have this very odd, I don't know what you want to call it, cyclical, cyclic, or periodic behaviors. Um, what is also interesting is the amount of pecking. So how often does each of these minutes or hours or days or months, how much of that is pegged? How much is it sitting at negative one or one? And it tracks very nicely with the actual, uh, it correlates strongly with the actual variance of the AGC signal, which we did not expect either. And so if some, some of you have insights into why the first couple of minutes of each hour of AGC has a big spike in variance. If you have any insight into this, why the winter times would be higher variance than other times, I'd be, I'd be curious. Um, so we can use help if we have any. All right, so the statistical model we built was based on this signal analysis we did. So take a white, given the Gaussian distribution, given the white sense stationarity, we can drive the system with a zero mean Gaussian noise. We can develop a filter for it, we know that low pass filter, we can decide in the second order filter where the bandwidth comes from the power spectral density. We have a gain on our filter. That gain is basically a standard deviation that comes from the pegging amount. The more pegging you have, you're basically spreading out the Gaussian to exceed the negative one one boundaries so that you can saturate and achieve the same types of pegging statistics that you would in the actual AGC signal. And so this is fairly straightforward. This is nothing special. And so how well does it work? 
And so we wanted to test the statistical model on 10 55-hour snippets of AGC in PJM's data set. And so we tested it, and you can see, so the basic, basic story is this statistical model is quite representative. Uh, we looked at these 10 different snippets of 55 hours each, and you can see that the mean, the errors in the mean of the statistical signal versus the actual snippets, 55-hour snippets, is quite low. We're in the order of a, this is mean between negative one and one, so this is a couple percent. Uh, errors in standard deviation of the AGC signal is very small. Pecking percentages, we're actually able to capture the pecking um, amount in the statistical model of AGC relative to the actual data. And so we would argue that this statistical model is fairly applicable across a wide number of, uh, or across the whole data set. So that's the statistical model. This model we've used once for control the design, taking into account the uncertainty of AGC. The other question we had building predictive models is how can we forecast it? How much time do I have? Okay. And so baseline forecast is a, basically we're building an ARMA forecast. Disappointing some of you maybe. No AI yet. It's coming. Um, and so we basically just fit parameters for an ARMA model, realizing from the partial autocorrelation, we just need three lags. We looked at the robustness of that choice across different training sets, and we see that autoregressive coefficients are quite constant across different number of snippets. And so we argue that our model is robust, a uh, forecast model is robust. We look at tracking errors. You can see here that lead times are in the order of seconds. So how well can we predict AGC 30 seconds out, 60 seconds out? This, sec this system updates every couple seconds. We're on the, you know, looking at 15% error or so, which is fairly small. Uh, we looked at both tracking the actual power signal itself, and we also looked at tracking the slope. Because perhaps you don't really care about what the actual value of AGC is going to be, but where it's going. Is it going up or going down? And so we so obviously slope errors, the classification, the cluster, so you would do better than tracking the actual power point-wise in time. Uh, we then compared, this is based on reviewer comments, we compared our autoregressive models with a number of neural network implementations and showed that autoregressive does really well. Um, and it's not greatly outperformed by the neural networks. And so we, we like that. We then were able to speak with University of Tennessee and borrowed some frequency data from PMUs and said, let's integrate the PMU data with our AGC historical data and then built a vector autoregressive model. And so we created a filter for the frequency data because it came in at 100 milliseconds. We showed that with frequency data, we can improve the forecast by a couple percent. Um, not super surprising, but interesting. Um, and then what we did was we implemented the predictor this forecast, the VAR, this, great. We implement this predictor to provide a forecast of AGC, which was then fed to a model predictive control of our packetized energy management scheme. And so as an aggregator, we could then use historical data, build the model, and then optimize performance, or essentially pre-compensate our reference signal to, to the coordinator's actions. And so this is a we're not optimizing the individual decisions. We're essentially just shaping. So this is similar to what Ali did yesterday. So we're basically doing pre-compensation for PEM. And it's optimal with respect to PEM dynamics, uh, which are dealing with these down-ramp limited events. And so what we showed, what we can show, is that with these predictions, PEM, which is down-ramp limited, under normal circumstances would basically track this blue signal, and then at this point, PEM vanilla would accept packets at this point, and these packets lock in because a packet is accepted, it's locked in for a certain amount of time, and so you're down, down ram limited during this time. If you can predict that your AGC signal is going to come down, you can pre-position your, your resources by pre-rejecting resources, and therefore achieve better tracking performance. And we're not talking about 50% better tracking performance. We're talking you know, an order of the percent or so. And so the question is, you know, is the percent worth all the effort? Uh, we didn't know that a priori. 
But when it comes to you know, running a number of these tests, overall we looked at the autoregressive models, a half percent improvement with uh, a prediction, a, a precompensating, an optimal precompensator. With the VAR vector autoregressive, we have about a 0.8% improvement. With perfect forecasts, cheating, uh, we see a PJM performance score that improves by 15%. And so what we did here was very, very preliminary forecasting. We don't have amazing results, but they're decent. Uh, but what we're seeing is that there's value in going further because if we can cut, get into closer to 10 to 15%, that's significantly valuable for an aggregator. Um, and so that's, that would be my, my hope is that you know, we can push this further and, and improve the forecast. And so we build a model, a statistical, statistical model, we validate it, we have forecasting. Our goal next is really to think about other resources, other data sets we did not integrate. So weather data, load, price data, and more frequency data. And then different locations in the network could be interesting. Um, and then comparing different methodologies for frequency regulation, PJM versus CAISO versus ISO New England. Further validations, more discussions with TSOs and ISOs to understand some of their methodologies. And then develop more use cases for the models and for forecasting so that it can become more impactful. So that's all I have. Thanks. Um, we have only one question. Who's going? Uh, Daniel Kirshen, University of Washington. Do you have any idea why PGM doesn't give the parameters that they use to calculate reg D? I don't know. I don't know. Would, would they give me all the parameters for their filters? Yes. Interesting. But then I can just read. I don't know. OK. Oh, oh, I see. So they did not when I asked them. They didn't say why. But that would be. If we could get that, that would be interesting. OK. Yeah. The problem with this one. They have different filters in there. I don't know. I'll answer other questions, I promise. OK, thank you. Next. I ran away with the microphone. You, you ran away with the microphone. So while we're waiting for the changeover of microphone, so my joke is motivated from talking with uh, uh, yesterday. And uh, so anyway, it goes something like, old power systems never die. They just lose their balance. <laughs> so it kind of follows on a little bit. OK, so the, the next presentation uh, is given by Deepak Ramasubramanian. How's yeah, that? Um, and looking at low inertia systems. Just check if it's working. This one, this one. Right, right. right. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. So, thanks, Ian. So, I'll be giving this presentation. It's work that um, We've done here HEPRI. In fact, Georges's advisor is sitting here. Did a good job with Georges. Thank you, Sparrows. <laughs> um, we've been looking at the aspect of fast frequency response. Now, fast frequency response has come up in quite a few discussions across the industry, especially with inverter-based resources, and the need for fast frequency response from these inverter-based resources. But what also is crit critical is where in the network is that fast frequency response being provided? And how does that location from which that fast frequency response is being provided, how does that impact the stability of the network? So not going to take too much time here. I think we all know about this, and we've covered it in previous presentations. It's essentially what we want to do with frequency response is limit the rate of change of frequency, ensure that the nadir doesn't go below the UFLS threshold that we have, ensure we have a good recovery of frequency coming down to a stable operating point, and then secondary frequency control, as Matt's presented, will take care of bringing it back to nominal later on. So we are going to be focusing on just the primary frequency control part. Now, what's are happening is as you have reduction in system inertia, you have more inverter-based resources coming in, uh, and you have different kinds of instability, you have different kinds of 
frequency reserves, you have different kinds of disturbances. Even the type of disturbance can change. Now, the frequency response trajectory of the system, the response of the system with respect to load generation imbalance is continuously changing. And typically what happens is inverter-based resources, because they have some amount of delay in the way they respond, so just looking at different kinds of response delay where you go from all the way from 100 millisecond delay, uh, even with synchronous machine, to around one second delay with inverter-based resources, you get a wide variety of frequency trajectory and some of them have a much larger rate of change of frequency, some of them have a much larger value of, of or lower value of nadir, which we want to avoid because then you might have a UFLS threshold sitting here, you might have rate of change of frequency relays which might operate at this period of time, uh, especially in the distribution system, and fast frequency response can be a way to compensate that. But depending upon where you put fast frequency response, it can have an impact on the stability of the network. So now here, for example, if you look at fast frequency response delivered from regions of the network that are electrically far away from the load, so you have more impedance in between the load and the place at which fast frequency response is being provided, you have more phase lag between the two locations, and if you try to provide fast frequency response from those locations, it can actually have a detrimental impact on the stability of the network itself. So this aspect about receiving fast frequency response, this aspect about asking inverter-based resources to provide fast frequency response has to be designed in a proper manner because fast doesn't always equal stable. And depending upon how much electrical distance you have, depending upon what is the characteristics of the transmission path, from the resource, from the inverter-based resource to the load center, you can have a very different kind of frequency response trajectory. So here in this example, we had a case where we had uh, your traditional synchronous machine case is the blue curve, which is just served as a reference. And then if you have fast frequency response provided by inverters, wherein in this case there was probably around 80% inverter-based resources providing fast frequency response, but they are located far away from the load centers then in trying to push that response in a shorter period of time through the transmission path, you generate an oscillation. And you can, of course, slow it down by changing where the fast frequency response is being provided from. You can make that, mitigate that oscillation by changing the way in which you provide fast frequency response, or you can mitigate it by allocating the fast frequency response in different percentages. But how can you determine that a priori? How does the utility plan for that how do they understand where can there be an issue in their system is what we wanted to address. So we wanted to know if there is a way we can derive a metric, derive an analytical way of evaluating is a particular location on the system suitable for fast frequency response or not? And if it is not suitable for fast frequency response, what can make it suitable? What is the mitigation method to be applied at that particular location? Assuming that's an inverter-based resource location, so what should be the mitigation method we put in there to ensure that it becomes suitable for fast frequency response? Now, traditionally, all of these analysis methods use the center of inertia frequency. So there is a common frequency or the app. You can look at center of inertia frequency in different ways, but the most simplistic way of looking at it is an average frequency across the entire network. So we know that during, transient, during a transient, different portions of the network will have a different frequency trajectory, especially when the disturbance occurs, that areas at which the disturbance occurs will have a more change, a rapid change of frequency, will have a larger change of frequency. Areas which are farther away from the disturbance will have a slower change of frequency and so on. But the system will synchronize and come back to the same settling point. And if you take an average, either that average is a weighted average, a spatial average, however you want to define it, if you take that average, you define your center, center of inertia frequency. So traditionally, the center of inertia frequency, which would be this curve in both cases across the entire network, was the one that was used to evaluate whether there's an appropriateness of frequency response being provided or not. But we wanted to move away from that. We wanted to see what else can we do and see if we can even use local frequency measurements to really evaluate uh, in an analytical manner. So we set about deriving some transfer functions, the details of it is all there in the paper, so I'm not gonna spend too much time on it. But we essentially wanted to find out, can we derive the transfer function in a frequency domain approach and identify 
can we like really identify if there is a peak in the res is there a resonance coming up is there a peak from the uh, frequency domain function that we can identify at what frequency would that come up uh, and can we use that to really determine the location at which it's you can you have to have fast frequency response and the location at which you have to really put in more mitigation uh, measures so in the if you just take that same scenario in the traditional sense again you can use the center of inertia frequency to really construct a transfer function which will take into consideration your governor response that you have at a particular location. Uh, and here, governor response can be equal for both inverter-based resources and synchronous machine resources. Just the time constant will change because we are assuming a simplistic frequency droop function. But you use the center of inertia frequency as your disturbance signal. You evaluate your simplified representation of your entire system as your, the plant that you want to control. And you can create the transfer function for that. But that, again, doesn't really help us from the perspective of identifying the locational aspect of frequency response. It can help identifying whether there is going to be a problem overall in the system, but it doesn't really help us from the perspective of is there a particular problem at a particular location, and can we really identify how to allocate frequency response around different locations in the system. And just to give you a preview of how this really manifests is you can really look at this from the simple chain system example. Wherein, supposing you assume that you have three different or five different resources all connected by impedances. And these are all electrically closely connected, so they have a very high susceptance value. And let's assume that this particular resource does not have any kind of frequency control. And they can be assumed to be our traditional inverter-based resources uh, that don't have any kind of frequency control or have a frequency control on a very slow time frame. And if a disturbance occurs in that region, then they are essentially relying on the neighboring units to help that area. Uh, and you can think of this as multiple areas of the system, right? So you have one area, let's say, in the north of the system, one area in the west of the system, and you have the simplified representation to really visualize what will happen. Now, even if this resource or this set of resources does not have uh, any kind of frequency control enabled on it, if a load change occurs, then because they are electrically closely connected, the response from the neighboring areas will come in a, so to speak, fast manner to this area where they, you don't have any kind of governing response, and you wouldn't see any noticeable change in the frequency across this entire areas. But if you have the exact same scenario, but instead, now you make the connections weak. So you have electrically uh, farther away uh, scenario where in this same area is now uh, much farther away electrically from the two resources, then the same response will start providing or the same event will start showing up as a response in this manner where because it takes time for the response to propagate from this area and fr from the two neighboring areas to this area, by the time that response propagates, your frequency in this area is going to really drop. So it's not just a function of not having inertia in this, in this area, it's also a function of how long will it take for the disturbance to propagate to that uh, kind of an area. Now, this is what we want to try to address, as in uh, if we have fast frequency response from this location, will it help in the local sense, but will it cause disturbances in the global system sense? So what we set about doing is taking about the local frequency at each particular location and derive a transfer function around it. Again, not going to go through many of the details here, but we essentially created a new transfer function that is, again, a disturbance response ratio. But instead of taking center of inertia frequency as its input, it would take local frequency as the input. And then now we can have a multi-input, multi-output structure, which we can then use to define what is the appropriate location for, for frequency response. Just to test this out, here's an example system. Uh, it has synchronous generators connected at these various buses, and we brought about more number of inverter-based resources and decommitted some of the synchronous machines. And we also set up the case such that you have uh, different kinds of long transmission lines to illustrate an electrically farther away um, area in this entire network. So here's what happens if you say if you have move this cursor up here. So here's what happens if you consider all the fast frequency response provided from one bus 
versus no fast frequency response provided another bus. And if you look at the disturbance ratio, you can find out a peak occurring in the uh, transfer function, which gives us an idea about what you might expect from a frequency response perspective. Now, we, where we have not yet gone in this research is trying to identify what is an appropriate value of this peak. Like, what should be a threshold to determine whether it's bad or not bad? That's something which we're still looking at. But initial trends show us that if you start seeing these kind of resonant peaks in the disturbance response ratio that we have, then you can expect to see oscillations because of fast frequency response being provided from those electrically far away areas. But instead, if you either reduce the amount of fast frequency response that you provide from one region, or you reallocate that response. So now instead of having only 80% uh, in one area, you re reduce it down to 8% in that location, but split up that 80% into 72% from another location, you can reduce the resonant peak that you see, and you can get a stable response. So now we have a way to move fast frequency response around the system and we can really define at which bus, how much percentage of fast frequency response is applicable, how much fast frequency response is safe in order to um, not trigger any kind of um, oscillatory mode. There are, of course, other ways to mitigate it. It also gives us an idea to really understand whether we need to really bring in some kind of power oscillation damping control for inverter resources in those far away areas. So there are certain discussions going on in the industry about mandatorily requiring power oscillation damping control for new inverter-based resources. Now, power oscillation damping control is tricky to deal with in, in inverter-based resources because uh, when you have it from the active power triggered power oscillation damping control, it can have impacts on the energy source behind, which is not yet fully controllable, and reactive power, power oscillation damping control may not really achieve the kind of effect that you want in the system. So being able to identify which resources should mandatorily have some kind of power oscillation damping control so that it can ensure that fast frequency response being provided is suitable enough for the system is also one way in which we can use this disturbance response transfer function that we have, wherein we may know that at a particular location there is a chance of instability coming up because of fast frequency response being provided, and we can have ways to ensure that there's some kind of power oscillation damping control at that particular location. What this also helps with is it helps defining the rate and the magnitude of fast frequency response that may be required at a particular location. So we can start looking at standardization of this kind of fast frequency response with the range of applicability and the, range, the speed at which that response needs to come, which means that different regions around the network may not operate at the same speed of providing fast frequency response, but there's a range within which they can be set and tuned. Uh, pretty much, I think I covered all of these slides, I mean, all of these points on the slide. What we are also wanting to see is maybe there is a way to split the percentage of fast frequency response across different units in the system or in an area, and that can be used from a planning perspective, or that can be used from a perspective of procuring services from inverter-based resources. So uh, there's still a lot more work to be done with respect to this transfer function and the response ratio that we have, primarily trying to identify what is a good number, what is a bad number, how do we really characterize the difference between the various levels of resonant peaks that we may see. Uh, so that's something that we're still doing. With that, thank you. Claudio, I think, was first, but we'll move into the group discussion straight after that as well. Claudio Canizares, University of Waterloo, Canada. Uh, interesting work. I, I really appreciate it, but let me, let me ask you a question. Do you consider uh, communication delays? And let me explain why. In the context, we have been work, doing this type of work for the ISO Ontario. And we discovered that there were some very significant uh, communication delays related to uh, communication legacy protocols and, and systems, which when we tried to introduce these services uh, centrally, basically they were defeated by the communication delays. And in that context, we were looking at doing exactly what you were doing, but in a different, from a different perspective. So I was wondering whether you actually look at that from. Yeah. We don't have communication here because this is not centralized, right? So we are looking at it primarily from 
a decentralized local measurement and using only local measurements as inputs. So we're not seeing it from a wide area perspective uh, from the aspect of delivering that fast frequency response because we want that fast frequency response to be delivered within seconds of the disturbance occurring. So our aim was to try to ensure that we are only using local signals. Now, there could be communication delays within the inverter plant itself, depending upon what the plant controller sees and how that communication delay propagates down to the individual inverters or turbines in that plant. That kind of a communication delay varies depending upon the size of the plant itself. So we have not yet considered the communication delay inside a plant, but we are definitely not considering communication delay from a centralized controller on a system-wide level because our aim was not to have a wide area kind of a control system. It was pro fully localized. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much. And so I'll get, if we could have all of the presenters and any of the co-authors who choose to come down the front as well, that would be uh, great. And then we'll open up for, um, for discussion. We'll, um, We'll work towards a, f a fairly hard deadline of 12.30, otherwise all the food will be gone when we get up to, <laughs> to lunch. So, got to keep priorities right. So, so let's, let's start off with Patrick. Yeah. And then we'll go. Patrick Pansiati, from RT France, yes. Thank you for the very interesting presentation. Just a, a fundamental question. Why do we have this limit on the Nadir and the Rokoff? Is it possible to relax a bit these limits? And because I know that some island system when the Nadir and the Rokoff are terrible and they are, they are able to manage the system, of course, with some transient and not very nice for the synchronous machine, but at least they are able to survive. So perhaps it is better to, perhaps to define this value rather than to spend a lot of money to, I don't know, to buy a lot of services. Yeah, well, so, yeah. so, so you're definitely right, Patrick, that we can just go down the route of relaxing the Rokoff limit that we can sustain. It's a little bit linked to distribution level protection and the devices on the distribution system because a lot of the Rokoff-based tripping that we have seen are primarily based upon what can be sustained by devices on the distribution network with respect to how fast they trip. And that is from a standardization perspective. Now, there was, like in National Grid UK, they used to have 0 0.125, 0 0.125 hertz per second as their Rokoff limit for tripping. And they have now actually changed that to, I think, 2 hertz per second. Now, if you look at IEEE 1547, IEEE 1547 says it should, any device connected to the distribution feeder should be able to withstand 3 hertz per second as a Rokoff limit measured over 500 milliseconds of a window. So definitely, yes, the first scheme of first mitigation aspect would be to relax those Rokoff limits. But that comes, that's also not at zero cost. So that comes with, you have to go down to every device at the network the distribution level, identify whether the limit can be relaxed or not, does the device have the capability to change its parameters, and also, if it does change its parameter, does it require recertification? Because a lot of the devices connected under the distribution network are actually, at least from the DER inverter perspective have to be UL certified if they have to be IEEE 1547 compliant. So would changing that parameter require a recertification is also something that has to be considered. So definitely, yes, the first scheme would be to, to take that out. Uh, but in the event that is not, or the, if supposing a lot of devices cannot be changed, those parameters cannot be changed, then we have to deal with it from the transmission system perspective. It does bring up a different question also that if we move towards a future where there is inverter-based resources on the transmission system, inverter-based resources on the distribution system, and load is variable frequency drive interface with everything as part of electronic interface, then maybe these don't matter at all anymore, but that may be also a distant future. I would like to also to add something about that. So for instance, in, uh, in, in Europe, uh, and so we, um, and even the, the directive, the European directive states that uh, the maximum rock off is two hertz per second. Uh, however, the, the TSOs are more um, uh, comfortable when they, they have a, um, a limit of one hertz per second. But in fact, 
the, the limit that it defines the European directive is two words per second. And um, regarding the continental network in, in Europe, for instance, um, the problem is not uh, the having load shedding because of the rock of pro uh, protection operation, because it doesn't exist. So usually the, the load shedding takes place at uh, certain levels of frequency, like uh, 49.6 hertz, I suppose, is the first set for load shedding. Um, but um, uh, if you go to UK or if you go to Ireland, then the rock off is a problem. And that, that's the problem. And uh, anyway, uh, I also agree that uh, we can relax a little bit more the, the rock off limits. And, uh, but th this is also very much related with the way how the distributed generation units are capable to respond to that. Because, um, for instance, in, 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 the, in the Iberian system, when last year in July, when there was the, the split between the, so the Central European system and the, the Iberian system, uh, there were several uh, units that um, were um, disconnected from the grid uh, because of the rock off. So generation units. And of course, this needs to be revised. It, it, it cannot happen, of course. So I, I fully agree that, and I mentioned that in my, in my presentation, that we have to revisit that issue because this is one, is this, this is one of the ways to cope with the problem. Okay, so Claudio is next. I think John was, had a question. For others who have questions, can you line up behind the, and we'll, that will make it more efficient and keeping in mind that 12.30 is a hard deadline. <laughs> Uh, Claudio Canizares, University of Waterloo. Uh, my question comment was in general to the panel, but specifically to Joao, uh, and it's the issue of virtual inertia. And, and this comes from a, a, a challenge, a question posed by, by a very smart fellow from industry, but said, why are we trying to slow down the response of these units? Why don't we take benefit that they are fast and respond fast to fast variations? Basically, the reg, reg D, reg A approach. Why do we want to slow down? Why do we gonna want to put virtual inertia in the systems when they could be responding fast to these frequency variations? And this is more of a conceptual issue, which I think is valid and would be appreciate some thoughts on that. Thanks. Okay. So, uh, I mean, uh, well, the best way to cope with this is, in fact, to, to have synchronous inertia. Because it, synchronous inertia is there, is instantaneous, is the capability of the system to respond instantaneously. Okay, uh, alternatives. One of the alternatives can be um, uh, virtual inertia. Um, but in that case, the problem is always related with the way how the control is, is, is developed and very much dependent on the, um, the measurement and on the processing. Uh, because, for, for instance, um, if, if we are relying on virtual inertia provided by uh, grid-following units, then the, the PLLs uh, introduce um, uh, some delays, <laughs> some extra delays, that, and that at, the end of the, at the end of the day, as I uh, described, the benefits you can get in terms of Rockoff are not the ones that uh, could be obtained. W what you can get is, in fact, a reduction in the nadir. And this is clear. This, this is the, the, the benefit you can get. Sure, but keep in mind that all of this is a legacy issue from synchronous machines. This is, right? sorry? It, we are trying to slow the system down so it works like it used to be. But we have very fast response and we have because of wind yeah. and solar. On the other hand, we have very fast responsive units with energy storage. Mm -hmm. So if they can compensate and yeah. basically, com uh, that was the argument that this fellow was making. Anyway. Yeah, but, 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 to, but the problem to be continued is, all, is over always lunch. the delays. To be continued over lunch. Sorry. <laughs> Rodrigo had a comment. It's just a quick follow-up, but uh, it, I, I think Claudio has uh, already mentioned it. Uh, inertia is a legacy from synchronous machines. And uh, to my mind, uh, all the attempts to provide virtual, in, virtual inertia are uh, attempts to coordinate the responses of the, the, the generators that don't have 
this uh, uh, type of response with the ones that we already know how they respond. Uh, well, uh, if we want to go for something else, we have to bake, break a, a paradigm, basically. So this, this is just a, a comment on why we want virtual inertia to be there, because we understand how uh, inertial response is beneficial to the, to the system. Okay, thanks. We'll move to John and then Spiros will be next after that. This is John Simpson, University of Toronto. So uh, uh, Mads posed this question. Uh, you saw there was a lot of variance in the first few minutes in the, the ACE signal, was it? Uh, and I, I just had a thought that that might be due to net interchange schedule adjustments. I don't know if you happen to know the, the periodicity of those in the PJM. I, I do not, but... So the... <laughs> I will let Maria answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> I've been overridden. Uh, yeah, we did a lot of studies on another power ISO that I can't mention now. And you look, the biggest issue that they have, they really don't know what is the actual interchange. They only know what they committed. There is no valve there. So this is the main reason for offsetting. Okay. Uh, and maybe just to clarify, the, the y-axis is quite narrow. So it looks like a large variation, but it's relatively small. I think so. It's, it's all relative. Okay, great. Uh, Robin Priest from the University of Manchester. Um, I really, just about the last presentation from Deepak, I really like this work. Um, you, uh, certainly in the UK, all the, the markets that clear frequency services ignore location. They, they treat anything from everywhere as being as valuable as everything else. Do you think that's going to have to change? And, and what do you think is the mechanism for doing that? So it will depend all on how the network evolves also. Um, but I think there does need to be an aspect about locational that needs to be considered, especially if looking at fast frequency response. If you look at the other services, then location doesn't play too much of a role. It's Almost like we have to start treating fast frequency response the same way as we get voltage control or reactive power services where it does have a locational impact. Uh, and depending upon now how the network evolves, uh, that there should be a need to consider locational for frequency also. I would like to add something on that. Um, for instance, this, this is very much related with the problem that we, system operators will face soon that is um, regarding grid forming uh, units. So, um, shall we define uh, a location, the best location for grid forming units, and well, as well as the size? So, sizing and location of grid forming units, this is a problem that I believe that needs to be addressed. I enjoyed it. So Spiros from DDU, I enjoyed the discussion, but I'll move a bit different direction towards the presentation for the single phase inverters. It's more a, clar clarifying, more of a clarifying question. So do they impact frequency stability differently than three phase? Or what is, because you were talking about the single phase inverter and single phase macro grid, right? So is it difference from the three phase? Yeah, very deep, uh, big difference between the three phase and the single phase. We are now developing a single phase, and then we have now considered to them collaborating with uh, between phases is that the future works so um, so what are the main differences what what do you mean compared to three phase no no Spross, can you talk into the <laughs> yeah, so, uh, what are the main differences compared to the three phase system uh, that ma makes us uh, th that creates a need to start with a single phase so just try to understand I, I'm not sure, but, but uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I couldn't uh, get grasp of your uh, question. But um, single phase inverters in the full bridge inverters, and then that, that same, same structure. And then we have implemented on the single phase inverter. Do you know what I mean? No, okay. After yeah, that, we have, we have to have lunch. Much better later. Christian. Okay, yeah, Christian Rehtans, TU Dortmund University. My preferred question in PhD examinations is sometimes, what is the frequency? 
because when I see the RMS simulations, we have a well-defined frequency and looks like we have in textbooks and so on, frequency 50 hertz, and then there's a step and going downwards and so on. But that only takes place theoretically at the place of the event. If you're a little bit further away, it is round. And the question in reality, if you have some solutions where you have to measure the frequency first, you always need an interval. And then it's really the question, when is it instantaneous? Action, when is it really, uh, yeah, really some, some fast acting frequency control, or when is it really uh, inertia or, or virtual inertia? And that thing has to be very uh, yeah, clarified very much in detail. And one question would be is it sufficient to do RMS simulation, or don't we have to do EMT simulations always? And as well, it leads to the definition of Rokov, because the Rokov, is it a, a point in, in, on the timeline, or is it an interval? You say, okay, you have an average Rokov over a couple of 200, 300, 400 milliseconds, which as well makes a, makes a big difference. Because if you start in the point of the event, and then it's going down somewhere, and so if you, you have an average the Rokov, it's much, yeah, much lower than if you look on the maximum point theoretically. And I think in practice they don't look on the theoretical maximum, they somehow build an average. So it really has an impact on the solution. Maybe you could comment yeah. on that. With respect to what is frequency, um, Ian will not let me answer because that will take probably three, four hours to answer and we have to go for <laughs> well, lunch. That's fine. <laughs> but you'll be here by yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, so it's definitely a valid question of what becomes or what would be frequency in a invertebrate resource system. But so keeping that aside, regarding Rokoff, definitely over an interval, never, never instantaneous, never at one point. And I would even say it should be like 500 milliseconds of an interval and not 100 milliseconds of an interval, because as you rightly said. Depending upon where the disturbance is, you will always find a larger Rokoff at the disturbance location, but that doesn't propagate out into the system. And by the time the system synchronizes or blends together, you would start seeing a lower, lower Rokoff. So definitely has to be regarding, again, RMS versus EMT, and is RMS sufficient and in EMT? Let's discuss offline, because that's also very, very contentious topic, which we can keep discussing for, for many hours. Well, uh, may I? Oh, sure, please. Yeah. So I, th I, um, I think that indeed, um, looking at, um, for instance, Rokoff, which is uh, one of the metrics of the problem that we have been addressing, is very important to define exactly how we are measuring that. And uh, typically, uh, the Rokoff uh, is measured in a window of 500 milliseconds. But, for instance, in a model of center of inertia, 500 milliseconds doesn't capture, and with 500 milliseconds window, is not going to capture the fast changes that exist. So therefore, uh, this is the reason why, for instance, in our, in our paper, we had a window of 100 milliseconds, because this was a compromise between, okay, the 500 milliseconds that would give um, a very comfortable value regarding the Rokoff, and for instance, to get the Rokoff instantaneously, just to measure on the, the, the instant where the, the disturbance took place. And so uh, it's really necessary to define what exactly this, mean, this means, and I, I fully agree, for instance, that in, in, a, in a system with um, uh, inverters and grid forming uh, converters in this case, we have different frequencies, completely different frequencies. The frequency, the synthetic frequency that a grid forming converter produces is completely different than the electromechanical oscillations we, we can get. So this is a very important port, point and it needs to be uh, well uh, defined and assessed. Okay, Andreas. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Andreas Ulbig from RWTH Aachen University. Um, so I have a, a reference and a question regarding to Matt's paper. So you were asking for references on similar work. So um, about 10 years ago, we did a study with the same question for, or similar question, for the Swiss TSO, Swiss grid. 
So we built a linear regression model on the AGC signal for continental Europe and then used an MPC scheme for tertiary frequency control dispatch. It was actually shown that there is some optimization potential with that. Um, and then, well, another hypothesis on the variations on the hourly change, couldn't it be just an artifact of market activity that many generators are ramping up and down around the hourly change? So my, my assumption going into this was that you would see market, partic market changes be disturbances yeah. that AGC would then correct. And so that would be my hypothesis. Yeah, OK, because yeah. that would be plausible. Then, yeah, and on the Swiss grid study, there's an ACC paper from 2012. If, okay. yeah. yeah, please, yeah. Yeah, you can I share it. reference, yeah. yeah. All right. Hamid Zaharipur, University of Calgary. I, I have a question for Matt. Um, my understanding is that what we see as AGC signal is essentially the reaction of the system to the random variations of supply demand imbalance, which essentially whatever we haven't been able to predict and handle comes randomly and this we have system to react to it. So has anything changed in that understanding of frequency regulation, signal, and service that um, there is, obviously you, your model is detecting a pattern. So before, and the, the reason there is no work on that because essentially it was predicting the unpredictable. So if, if it's random, if we assume that it's random, it's unpredictable. So has anything changed that you see a pattern in, a, in a essentially random signal? So, Thank you. So I would argue that there are stochastic, certainly stochastic elements to load variations that cause the ACE, but the ACE goes through a filter and generates the AGC signal. The REC D signal is a filtered signal. And that filtered signal, it, but it's slower. So it's, a, it's an average of some, some sort of average that seems to be predictable on a 30 second time scale. We, you cannot go further than that. I think a you know, five minute prediction would not be, point wise in time is not, we didn't see that as being suitable. But I, yeah, I, did, I wouldn't argue that it's purely random based on what we saw. Okay, lucky last question. Great, yeah. I don't have a question, I just have a comment. I really think it's probably time to demystify the phrase frequency, it's really a simple reflection in voltage current or power of your rotating machine speed collectively. There's really that, no, not that much mystery about it. Anyone want to follow up? Or we have one minute. <laughs> so, I, so I get to follow up without a rebuttal, right? Yeah, okay. <laughs> It's, it's definitely a manifestation of the power imbalance and the speed of a machine, but it's not necessarily the same when you have inverters because you no longer have that electromechanical magnetic link. So then it becomes a manifestation of how phase angle changes across the network, and that phase angle change across the network need not be linked to only active power change. So there is some aspect there which we may have to think about a little bit more because our definition of frequency so far has been linked to the magnetic response of the machine and how it links to the rest of the system. Okay, on that happy note, there's plenty to, dis to, to uh, discuss over lunch. So uh, thank the uh, presenters and the authors and the audience.